The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome to the uh, fifth lecture, the, the first of a series on, uh, on RNA and uh, expression analysis. First, a quick review of uh, last week, and it's it has significant connections with this week, uh, where we talked to uh, the topic of alignments and different algorithms for obtaining pairwise alignments, in particular dynamic programming. This led to an even harder problem, which is multi-sequence alignment, from which we will um, draw pretty heavily at the beginning of, of the discussion today. And then the, the issues of getting the uh, motifs Another topic we will touch upon several times today, how you get, once you have a multi-sequence alignment, how this gives you uh, either a independent weight matrix where different uh, positions are independent, or in a hidden Markov model where there is some dependence between, say, adjacent uh, nucleotides in a, in a simple sequence such as CG. <coughs> so let, let, let's just carry over these, these thoughts about uh, multi-sequence alignment, motifs, and non-independence of positions in sequences to the next level higher. We will eventually talk about protein three-dimensional structure, but a really beautiful intermediate between proteins, uh, the complexity of the protein structure and the simplicity of double-stranded DNA is the, is the folding of RNAs. Um, because they obey some of the same rules of double-strand DNA, but they uh, uh, have the complicated structures of, of, begin to have the complicated structures of proteins. So we'll, we'll start with this integration of uh, multi-sequence alignment motifs with RNA structure, and then we'll uh, switch to, a, uh, to tell about how these RNA structures play their role by achieving different uh, levels in the cell. In other words, we want to be start to introduce how we become quantitative about the, um, the amounts and uh, localization of RNAs in the cell. Some of these, some of the measures that we'll be talking about and the tool, the computational tools will be more appropriate <coughs> for uh, individual measures and others will be more what we call genomics grade, uh, or, uh, high throughput and high uh, accuracy. Then we have uh, this, since this is a, a, a new category of uh, biological data, we, we have to address random and systematic errors, just as we did for genotyping and sequence data. This is a new, a, a new set of them and a new set of solutions about the same themes of random and systematic errors. And if, then we'll talk about a uh, particular set of interpretation issues that lead to additional considerations. And, and we'll end on time series data, which will be a, a, a theme that will connect this talk to much later talks on systems biology, where the ability to connect with uh, time series will help uh, establish causality and, um, and connectivity. And we'll do it, and we'll tie it to the subject of RNA analysis by looking at messenger RNA decay. Now, slide three is a, uh, a reminder that we'll, we'll use in two different contexts tonight. First, uh, these are the bell curves that you've seen, at least three of them integrated before, the, the uh, two discrete binomial Poisson and the normal, which is uh, uh, symmetric around the mean of 20 in this case. Um, and we're just to connect to the discussion from the last time, where we, where we were asking what the significance of a uh, match of a single sequence to a database might be. When you're asking for a match of a single sequence to a database, you're typically really asking for the maximum match or the maximum, t the, the most extreme uh, matches. And so when you talk about s extremes, when you're sampling from a distribution and you're looking for the most extreme value, for a finite uh, sampling of that distribution. That tends to be not from the normal distribution, which would be random sampling, but from which is this uh, 
<coughs> middle uh, magenta curve, um, but instead it would be extreme value distribution, which is this blue curve, which you can see in this case, since we're looking for extreme maxima, it shifted slightly to the right, and uh, so you can see that it comes inside of the, of the other bell curves uh, on the left-hand side and goes outside on the right-hand side. If we were looking for extremely low values, then it would have been shifted to the left. And remember, all these continuous functions uh, go off to negative infinity and positive infinity, although at extremely low levels. Okay, so that, and then the, that's the extreme value distribution. Now, in order to co connect this uh, nucleotide sequence, which we've been seeing it ha has these wonderful Watson Crick base pairs of where T TNA and so forth, is to this more complicated tertiary structure, we're going to go through an intermediate of secondary structure where we really look at whether what kind of base pair can form. And I'm going to immediately introduce uh, some complexities so you don't uh, get uh, too complacent right off the bat. Somewhere in this slide of non-Watson Crick base pairs is a Watson Crick base pair. Take a moment to find it. Fine. Okay, so since we haven't introduced base pairs, you, it's going to oh, well, we've seen it twice now in double-stranded DNA. Right in the middle here, labeled A, is an AU base pair, which is Watson Crick, where the black dot indicates the, uh, the attachment to the ribose in RNA or the deoxyribose in DNA. And you'll find three other AT base pairs, one right to the right of it and uh, two down below. And these, these four AT base pairs are all different from one another uh, in terms of it most easily imagined in terms of the orientation of the, uh, of the riboses, these black dots relative to one another. And each have uh, names, but the important thing is that the, all of these are, are illustrated such that they maintain the coplanarity of the bases. They typically maintain one or two or even three um, hydrogen bonds and the planarity allows them to stack on bases, base pairs below and above them, uh, just as you would in, in normal double-stranded DNA. S um, but sometimes the geometry distorts the double helix enough that you might get a penalty in the, uh, in the, in the uh, free energy in a thermodynamic sense, or the kinetics in a, in a sense. And here's another, so you can find almost you could basically make one of these base pairs for ev all of the possible um, combinations of A, C, G, and U in RNA. So mo and all of them will be coplanar and they'll have wo one or more hydrogen bonds. Probably the most stable and most commonly encountered uh, in otherwise normal d RNA double helices is the GU base pair. And you can see that this, this has fairly similar geometry to the AU base pair, or for that matter, the GC base pair. Okay. So let's see how these non Watson Crick base pairs appear in, in uh, this. This is, this is the transfer RNA that we saw a couple of slides ago spinning around in three dimensions. And the sequence that was behind it uh, was the, 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 the DNA sequence that corresponds to this unmodified RNA sequence on the right-hand side. Um, let's <coughs> what we have, you can think of this as four fairly canonical Watson Crick type double helices for uh, RNA double helices, which are uh, uh, slightly different from the DNA double helices. And, but in this, so we have seven base pairs, six of which are Watson Crick in the the top stem loop, starting at position number one with the five prime end and ending at position 72. So one and 72 is a GC base pair. And you can see that the anticodon where it meets the messenger RNA is at the bottom uh, right hand part of the slide. And there's this, if you just look at that, that loop, and th you've got a, a seven base loop and a five base pair anticodon stem. And so each of these so that each of these stems has uh, some distinguishing features. The number of base pairs ranges from four to seven. You've got a GU base pair in the middle of the top stem, 
Uh, and you've got little sequence boxes which are fairly conserved, uh, such as this T size CG uh, is actually in its original form is a UUCG. And the T and the, the psi, uh, or pseudouridine, are examples of modified bases, which are shown on the left side of the slide. You can see there's uh, quite a number of them. You can either methyl, you can add a methyl group, a CH3 group, to either of the bases, such as one methyl group on, on G, or you can add them to the riboses, such as the two prime methyl groups, which can go on any of the, of the four bases because it's modifying the ribose, which is generic. Most of the other ones are very specific to a base. So, for example, dihydrouridine is a modification that can only occur to uridines. The pseudouridine, same, similar thing, um, uh, and so on. So, each, each of these requires an enzyme, and we will highlight one of the enzymes that's involved in putting the methyl groups onto, onto uh, the sugars, the O2 prime methyl, in just a few slides. But right now, what we want to ask is, how did we get this folding structure? Now, this is not the, the three-dimensional structure. This is the intermediate between the primary DNA sequence and the fully modified, fully folded three-dimensional structure that we saw spinning around a couple slides ago. So the first thing is the, the way you can try folding this um, where you oppose uh, each base pair in turn to look for possible matches. And then, uh, what was done historically, this was in the mid to late 60s, was you take each new transfer RNA sequence and ask whether it fold, whether it makes a decent fold in this simple planar representation that's related to the previous ones, under the assumption, the hope, that there would be some conservation, not only of, of sequence, of some of these motifs like the T-size CG, but also the, the way that it folds up. And you might even hypothesize that maybe it doesn't matter what the sequence is in some of these stems. What's important is that it's capable of forming a stem, that it is that position one is complementary to position 72. If position one were to change from a G to an A, then position 72 should change from a C to a U. Okay, so how do we formalize this? Okay, this was um, how do we formalize the process by which we generate this so-called cloverleaf structure or any similar folding pattern for, for, uh, for small nucleic acids. And uh, what are the limitations of those, of those algorithms? And these dotted lines you see are, non, are some of the non-Watson Crick base pairs. Some of them will stack, many of them, some of them will actually form uh, the hydrogen bonds of a Watson Crick base pair, but they won't have, the otherwise have the rest of the geometry. They, these, and you can see that some of these will provide connections between two loops, which are separated by stems. And this kind of uh, uh, folding back means that it's not a, it's not a simple set of, uh, of uh, helices. So the way that we formalize this is we say that position number one, uh, if it's bound to position number 72, and the exact sequence um, maybe isn't as important as their ability to pair with one another, then you expect if you take a large number of, of transfer RNAs and do a multi-sequence alignment as we did last time, then the, in that multi-sequence alignment, you expect that, the, that the, when the G changes, the C will change too. And that's called covariance. And if you look at the vertical axis, the maximum uh, that can be achieved is the same kind of maximum that we had in the motifs. Uh, last lecture. The motifs, and we've actually had a couple of times, it can get up to two bits. Two bits is the, is the full scale for a, for a base pair or base, which can have four different values, A, C, G, or T. And we're calling this mutual information. It has the same units, a uh, full scale of zero to two bits. And so what we see uh, along the horizontal axes here, call them position I and J, um, which range from 1 to 72, which is the core part of the transfer RNA. The last four bases are added by a, um, a, uh, a specialized enzyme. But position number 1 and position 72, covary is shown by this peak in the um, far left-hand region. And in fact, there are seven peaks in a row there, where, uh, which correspond to the seven stacked base pairs. They covary. Uh, similarly, in the 
pseudo UC stem that we talked about a couple times there that those five nucleotides to vary as you would get in a in a um, uh, stem. The anticodon stem is another five, and the and the D stem, still named after the dihydrouridine modifications, is four base pairs. And the way that this is derived, and we're going to work through this an example in the next slide, but just just as a a labeling of this axis here, the mutual information between the I space and the J space, that is to see, for example, between I equals 1 and J equals 72, is simply the sum of the frequency of getting that particular I and J, F uh, is the frequency of getting, say, a, a G as position 1 and a C at position 72, times the, the, the log base 2, remember when we're talking about the information content of uh, nuclear, or, or of information in general, bits in a computer or, or nucleotides in a sequence, you do log base 2, and uh, as introduced by Shannon and others. So now it's going to be the log of that same frequency, so the frequency of getting that particular I and that particular J type, type of base, um, normalized now to the, the how, how frequently that those two bases occur throughout the uh, uh, throughout those positions. In other words, you know how often they co-occur at, at that at those two positions. Now, how often do they occur independently of one another? And that's what the the denominator is here. So when you take this ratio, you put it on a on a uh, on a conventional scale, and then then you have something that's analogous to the p log p of information theory, and you sum over <coughs> all of the uh, observed bases at positions i and j. Okay, a and that could, that's for a particular i and j. You sum over all the x's uh, that occur at positions say one and seventy-two, and then you do that, and then you repeat that. You can get this m sub i j for every um, matrix element going from 1 to 72 in a, in a uh, symmetric square matrix. Okay, so now let's work through this for two extreme examples. The extreme case where you have perfect covariance and the extreme case where you have no, no real association. So then we're going to illustrate this with a, with a toy uh, multi-sequence alignment here. This is just the same way we did a multi-sequence alignment uh, in the last class here, no, there are no insertions or deletions, but you can, it's the same thing. You could derive a weight matrix for this, and you would see that the first column, the far left-hand column, I equals 1, is, uh, has all four possibilities, and the, uh, so does the, the rightmost column of that multi-sequence alignment, J equals 6. And so let's calculate these two, are these uh, covariating in this simple multi-sequence alignment of four uh, six MERS. So we calculate the mutual information for I equals 1, J equals 6, um, M sub 1, 6. It's going to be equal to sum. Uh, the first term in the sum is for the AU, and then we're going to walk through CG, GC, UA, so there'll be four terms in the sum. Each of the terms will have, coincidentally in this case, have the same frequency for that particular pairing of AU. And remember, this is not a base pair. This is a covariant pair of nucleotides that could have been anywhere in the sequence. We happen to pick the first and the last base. Um, so they all have the same frequency. That frequency is one quarter. So the AU occurs one quarter of the, of the four sequences of multi-sequence alignment. So that's one quarter. And then, that, that remember, it's the same frequency inside the logarithm. But now, in the denominator, we're going to normalize it to the frequency that the A occurs in the I equals 1 position, which is 1 quarter, and the frequency that U occurs in the J equals 6 position, which is 1 quarter. So it's 1 quarter over 1 quarter squared, or 4. So 0.25 times log, log, log base 2 of 4 is going to be 2, and 0.25 times 2 uh, is going to be uh, 0.5, and uh, that's the first term. Right, that's for the AU uh, pairing. If you go down through all four terms, they all ha end up being the same form. Right? The frequency is always going to be 0.25 for the pair and 0.25 for each of the individual bases. So you end up with four of those, four examples of those. 
uh, for each of the four cases. And so 4 times 0.5 is, is 2. So that's consistent, hopefully, with what you would have expected for perfect covariance. You're getting the full information content, the full range of two bits. Uh, and so that's what we achieved. So now, as a control, or as just further uh, gratification that we actually understand this, um, as we'll work through the example of comparing i equals 1 with j equals 2. So the two far columns. And here, you're familiar with i equals 1. J, j equals 2 is always c. And so it's not covarying with, with uh, the first column, as, as in the previous example. So let's just work through it the um, same way. So the first uh, term in the series is 0.25 again, because the AC pair, not base pair, but, but, but um, pair of bases, is, uh, it occurs only once in the four of the multi-sequence alignments. So that's 0.25. And you have the logarithm base 2 of that same 0.25 now uh, normalized to the frequency of the A in, that, in its column, this one column which is 0.25, and the C in the J equals 2 column, which is, it's always there, it's unity, so it's 1. So now that's the big change here, is instead of having 0.25 in both the denominator terms, it's now 0.25 times 1. And so now it's 0.25 over 0.25, so you have the log base 2 of 1. This would be 0, and that zeroes out the whole term, and so you have mutual information of 0 as you would expect from this particular toy example where columns 1 and 2 do not covary. And so this is that the same formula as in the previous slide, a generalization of the one that we walked through uh, um, term by term. And here's the reference um, for that. So now, how do we go? So that was, we've taken now hundreds, possibly thousands of transfer RNAs. We've done a multi-sequence alignment. We produce that mutual information uh, pattern that we saw before, the 1 by 72, 1 to 72 by 1 to 72 um, comparison, where you got the spikes at each of the at each of the double helices. Now, how do we turn how do we turn that into more general practice? How do we generate uh, uh, secondary structures, which are kind of this intermediate in between the primary sequence and the three-dimensional structure, um, using a particular class of uh, experimental data combined with the sequence data. This does not necessarily require the large uh, set of uh, line sequences, but it will obviously benefit from it. You, want, you could do a secondary structure for each element in the, in the aligned sequence. Um, in order to, to and use the mutual information if you uh, have it. But let's just talk about just the, just the simple application of the, these thermodynamic parameters to the prediction of secondary structure. And what are our expectations before we go through the algorithm? How good is it? In this <coughs> fairly close to state-of-the-art paper, um, looking through over 700 generated structures, they have, <coughs> in each set, at, they con it contains one structure that on average has 86% of its known base pairs. That's not saying that it's necessarily identified as the top, the best uh, structure. It's saying that it has one structure by the criterion that they're using. This is a weak uh, self phrase. Um, but let's walk through how that works. When, when, when someone says that they're going to predict a secondary structure or a three-dimensional structure from a primary sequence, more or less from scratch, they really, do, they really typically mean that there's going to be a variety of other chemical data that they take into account, but it will be generic data. It will be not be specific chemical data for this particular molecule. And the generic data in this case are measurements of uh, of, the, of the thermodynamics of melting of model oligonucleotides, usually large amounts of them monitored spectrophotometrically. And from these, from the temperatures and of, mo of melting, basically at equilibrium where you're getting uh, half melted structures, 
you can determine the free energies um, where the negative free energies are the desirable ones, the ones that are, that are likely to happen um, if you let the system uh, go to equilibrium. And this is a kind of interesting application of the free energies for nucleic acids. Here, the algorithm that one uses it, it is concerned mostly with adjacent base pairs of base pairs. So it's not a base pair, as you might, th as you might think, that the hydrogen bonds that determine uh, the Watson-Crick and non-Watson-Crick base pairs would dominate. Instead, it's the stacking interactions that dominate. And since it's the stacking interactions that dominate, the hydrogen bonds are basically exchanging a water hydrogen bond for a base pair hydrogen bond. It looks very specific, but in terms of free energy, it's fairly weak. The free energy determine is determined more by the stacking of, of pi orbitals as uh, depending on the geometry that you get, say, when you have a, GC, a CG base pair on top of an AU base pair here at the bottom of this helix. And that, that stack uh, gives you a minus 2.1 kilocalories per mole. All the units on this are kilocalories per mole. And by going along and taking each of these stacks, remember a pair of base pairs is what you're measuring, you can get, you can get all the uh, negative free energies of the stacking. Then you have some penalties, some things that are less favorable, would not happen spontaneously if they did not uh, have these mitigating negative free energies already accumulated, which would be the loops and the bulbs here. This is a, this, the, the base pairs on either side of that bulb will stack up on one another and that bulb uh, will, uh, will kind of flip out of the double he otherwise regular double helix. Similarly, bases at the end have a slight penalty. Or lo or, or and so then you can add it all up, and you can calculate an overall delta G for the entire structure. And if you do enough of these things, you can get a feeling for which ones are likely to be um, occurring in, in your RNAs. Now this, is the, this, sh this, this should trigger in your mind as the third example that we've had where uh, the, mo the, the conceit of a motif analysis that you can do a multi-sequence alignment uh, and each, each column of that multi-sequence alignment is independent. This is the third example where that's not true. Uh, the, the, we, have, uh, we, ha we have here the free energies are dependent on pairs of base pairs. The uh, previous examples were uh, <coughs> the very distant connections that you can get in folding up a transfer RNA. And in in the earlier example was the CG dinucleotides. The, the assumption of independence of columns in a multi-sequence alignment is a very powerful one. I don't want to undermine it too much, but it, it doesn't hurt you to have three examples this early on in the course. Question the independence of columns of multi-sequence alignments. Very important thing to question. We wrote mutual information uh, theory that we had a couple slides ago is one of the most powerful ways of questioning that when you see it. Now, that's the way that this, uh, th this particular base pairing that we see here is one example. Now, you could take each of these uh, and shift the, the uh, right-hand half of the molecule relative to the left hand by one base pair. That would give you a much poorer uh, set of, of, of uh, energies and much, much you know, more bulges and more uh, longer loops and so forth. And you'd end up with a, a poorer delta, uh, delta G. And what you can do is you can rank and do one of these uh, uh, maximum value uh, searches by going through that. That's, this should trigger in your mind, this is a, another way of of thinking about that search, you, you take the entire uh, sequence, whether it's transfer RNA or in this case a 400 mer, uh, nucleic acid sequence, and you draw lines between every base, every basis that, that uh, where you have a favorable free energy, and you look for a set of lines which do not overlap one another, uh, because an, uh, uh, because the, these would represent short sequences, a local, you can think of this as a local sequence alignment between one half of the, of the uh, nucleic acid and the other half. 
Now, this is not a, a, a sequence identity, remember. This is a sequence complementarity. That is to say, a reverse complement, uh, where you sub complement means you've uh, substituted A's for U's and C's for G's. So you're looking for, um, but in, other, in many other ways, this is analogous to the dynamic programming, where we took two independent sequences and slid them along one another and allowed for insertions and deletions. Um, in that, in that dynamic program before, we we did that formally, all possible such slippages by setting them as the two uh, axes of a table, and then filled in the, uh, the the squares for all the matches. Here we would fill in the squares, not for the uh, matches, but for the free energy of of, of uh, the stacking for these short subsequences. Now, the reason that they don't cross over, and the reason for this little note in the uh, lower left-hand corner of slide 11 uh, that does not handle pseudonauts. Pseudonauts will explain in the next, uh, will show graphic examples in the next slide, but it basically means that if you allow subsequences to occur willy-nilly throughout the sequence, then you'll get, uh, you'll get these tangles that, uh, that for a while people uh, weren't sure whether they occurred or not. The, 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 the one or two non-Watson crick-based pairs that you might find C connecting up tRNA on these tangles were not considered long stretches that would connect loops. Um, but since then, they've been proven to be of great biological significance. In any case, to do this without the pseudo-knots, without allowing any crosses, is still a challenging problem. It's, it's basically the, the, the dynamic programming where, where n is the length of the, of the primary sequence, then takes on the order of n squared in compute time and space in order to um, figure out uh, all the, all the uh, possible pairings that can occur, and then you go through and you rank them, uh, which one gives the best free energy, and then you do the trace back and you get the top scores um, for that molecule. Now let's talk about pseudonauts. That, we, we excluded that, but now we'll re-invite it. We have, uh, we have those, those little ones, you know, a, a couple of base pairs in transfer RNA. But a much more dramatic one we alluded to in the, in the second lecture we talked about the genetic code. And, and in order to introduce you to exceptions of genetic code, I gave an example where the ribosome jumped over 50 base pairs if presented with the right context. It didn't follow the, the, the normal code of having a triplet and another triplet right in a row with no punctuation. Here we had the punctuation that required um, what may have slipped by at the time, a pseudonaut. And this is an example of, of one such pseudo-knot in a, the best that we can do of a two-dimensional schematic, and then something slightly better where we have a, a more three-dimensional and another three-dimensional view of this. And this is the RNA pseudo-knot, which is one of them, which is responsible for frame shifting in this uh, that breaks this genetic code. And so let's just follow how this, how this goes. You've you got basically a normal helix here at the bottom, starting at the 5 prime end, position 1 to 7. Then it, it would go through a normal 5 base, sorry, 6 base loop from 8 to 13, and then finish the, the, the stem 14 through 18. That would be a normal stem loop, um, where the loop is uh, 6 long, 8 to 13. But at the end of 18, you have this little green loop that, that goes back and now makes a nice perfect four base Watson Crick uh, 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 stem. Now, in the middle of what would have been a loop, and so the, this fold back is what we meant by uh, a, a pseudo knot and what would have been represented by a crossover of those red lines in the previous slide, something that makes it much harder to compute. In fact, it makes it so much harder in the next slide that it goes up from an order of n squared, which is your typical uh, dynamic programming of, in a pairwise alignment to order n6 in CPU time and order of n to the fourth power in memory space uh, that you need to set aside for storing up the table of pro possible pseudonauts that can occur in the context of the otherwise normal circle with the non-overlapping um, connections. This is a relatively recent uh, uh, innovation where a dynamic, it's still a dynamic programming algorithm, it just has more, uh, uh, more possibilities, more comp, more higher uh, algorithmic complexity. Um, 
and a combination of the biological discovery that pseudonauts are important for frame shifting and a variety of other biological phenomena, and the uh, now three dimensional structure and now an algorithm puts uh, pseudonauts well within the, the sort of things that you should feel comfortable. Now, we're going to go back to hidden Markov models in a slightly more complicated context here. Then we picked the simplest one we could, which was a dinucleotide, um, you know, simple unfolded straight DNA. And the part that was hidden, as you will recall, was whether the CG dinucleotides, or sorry, the dinucleotides, which could be any of the uh, possible dinucleotides, including AA, CG, and so on, whether it was present in a CG island, or whether it was in a region of, of the chromosome which was likely to have CGs, or whether it was in a CG ocean which was uh, low in G C C CG dinucleotide content. So the hidden part was a plus minus whether it was in an island or not. Now what we're going to do now is take this and transfer this over to the kind of motifs we are finding in RNAs, like transfer RNA and another class of RNA, and say, okay, now, whether it's the hidden part of the Markov, the Markov model is the transition probabilities. The hidden part is whether it's in a particular secondary structure or not. Not whether it's in an island or not, but a secondary structure, okay? In this particular case we're going to talk about is a very interesting biological illustration uh, where uh, the Hidden Markov models will be uh, modeling these boxes, these motifs that are involved in base pairing uh, or recognition uh, that forms the secondary structure of that's necessary for guiding a particular enzyme. Now remember we had all these modified bases that we used uh, that we saw in transfer RNA. Some of those are simple protein interactions with the transfer RNA that adds a methyl group here or there. It turns out that all the methyl groups, the O2 prime methyl groups, these are on the, on the sugar of the, um, of the ribose, in ribosomal RNA, a few, just a small number of a uh, few dozen of the riboses in this uh, multi-kilobase ribosomal RNA are methylated at O2 position. How does the enzyme know, or the enzymes know, to get exactly those bases? The way it knows is it it doesn't use pure protein uh, brute force uh, to make a, a complementary surface of protein and nucleic acid. It actually uses this elegance of, of base pairing to make a guide sequence. And so what it's looking for is <coughs> the protein um, cooperates with a small RNA, so-called snow RNA or small nucleolar RNA, to, re to to find a place where the snow will recognize the place that you want to methylate, and then the protein methylates that, the, the, uh, the, the base in the middle of that guide sequence. So, so then the, the, the game, the, bi the computational biology game that these authors played was how can we find all the small RNAs, the snow RNAs present in a genome when we know very little about that, that the uh, genome. We, th what they knew was they knew the genome sequence. This is for yeast. They had a few examples of snow RNAs in humans, uh, n almost none in yeast. They had the sequence of the ribosomal RNA, of course, they, and they could, they could, uh, they, what we, they wanted to do then is ask where, where in the genome do we have little guide sequences flanked by some of these other uh, motifs and characteristics like a, a base pair, uh, 48 base pair stem, that will match the ribosomal RNA. So you basically march along the algorithms, you march along the ribosomal RNA looking for matches elsewhere in the genome, and then ask whether those matches elsewhere in the genome have some of these other context uh, features. Okay. So you can see this is going to be a more complicated algorithm than just looking for CGs. Okay. So this is, this is how it works. That stem that we had, um, is, is now item number one. The various boxes, which were basically sequences, are now turned into ungapped hidden Markov models. The hidden uh, part of it is whether it is present or not in this, uh, in the context that adds up to this guide sequence. The guide sequence itself is a hidden Markov model, which has to be a 
uh, imperfect, probably imperfect duplex with the ribosomal RNA. So that's how that's modeled. Uh, the most complicated is that terminal stem number one, which is the so-called stochastic context-free grammar. That's what the SCFG stands for. And that just means that it is even less constrained than the HMM. The HMM is less constrained than a simple motif, which is less constrained than, say, a consensus sequence. It's, it is constrained. It has the grammar, if you will, are the particular rules for the base pairing that have to occur over a certain region in a certain part of the putative snow RNA. So anyway, you apply each of these criteria and you have transition probabilities which come in from a learning set such as the human snow RNAs. You have a learning set that tells you what these transition probabilities will be. And you, and you now apply this to the entire yeast genome and you get a bunch of candidate snow RNA encoding genes. Now you can't use things like the long open reading frames that you normally use for finding genes. So this is a very valuable tool. But now how do you convince yourself that you that you know uh, that this is a gene that this actually encodes a small uh, a snow RNA and that those are responsible for guiding the methylation of particular positions in the ribosomal RNA. The way you do that is, uh, well, bef before we get to how you do that, we want to we want to ask how does this algorithm perform relative to other, the few other algorithms are for finding genes which do not encode proteins. And the first of these actually dates well before 1991, but there were ways of looking for transfer RNAs in sequence. They would use everything we know about transfer RNAs. The little boxes that are conserved as sequences, the regions that are conserved only at, not as sequences, but as base pairing potential, uh, et cetera. The, the, the loop lengths were c are constrained. All the constraints that you can muster um, back in 91 were applied and it was fairly slow. It would only do 400 base pairs of, ch of genome chunk at a per second. Um, and when you have genomes on the order of many megabases, this is, this is slow. And it, it had, uh, it missed about 5% of the true positives. It had 95%. And false positive sounds impressive, only uh, 10 to the minus 6. But when you think of a double strand, both strands of E. coli being about 10 million um, bases, then this is about four false positives, and bigger genomes, of course, would be even uh, a larger number in absolute scale. So then, uh, six years later, the, the, the speed is now 100 times faster. You're now only missing 0.5 percent of the true positives instead of 5 percent, and the false positives is now vanishingly small. So very often, you can, you can just arbitrarily trade off uh, you, the number of true positives you missed with the number of false positives you get make one, you know, take one advantage of the other. But here was a win-win situation. They both um, went in a favorable direction. So how do the snow RNAs compare with that? Here, uh, another two years passed. We have the snow RNAs are just starting out. They have uh, probably a little better than 93 percent true positives. This is not as good as transfer RNAs. This may be uh, um, this may improve or it may not. Uh, the false positive rate is acceptable. Okay, so, so then the question becomes, how do you track down, the, after you've tracked down these genes, how do you then uh, prove that they uh, do what you think they do, that they actually are responsible for methylating the riboses of the bases um, in question? So it turns out that the technology we set up in the sequencing and genotyping lecture where you extend uh, with DNA polymerase uh, pr uh, a primer on a template. So the primer binds to the template and you extend by either uh, many base pairs as in the conventional dideoxy sequencing or well, one or two base pairs in some of the more um, up and coming uh, genotyping methods. Those extension methods, those DNA polymerase based extension methods will, will stall uh, when you run into this particular kind of modified base where the or a bulky group is introduced onto the uh, two prime position of the ribose on the template. So you're extending the primer, sitting on the template, and it will stall there. And it stalls more when you decrease the concentration of the de deoxynucleotide triphosphates in the extension reaction. That's what these little wedges mean at the top of each of these columns. They've done an extension, 
um, with all four triphosphates present, either in high amounts at the big end of the wedge or low amounts in the small end of the wedge. And to tell where you are in the sequence, this is using reverse transcriptase polymerase on uh, a ribosomal RNA template, to find out where you are, you do this dideoxy, which is basically the conventional DNA sequencing, where you terminate at either U's, G's, C's, or A's in the template. This allows you to get oriented. Basically, you're sequencing on the far left-hand set of lanes. And the pause sites um, are present, say, the wild type is the first pair of uh, lanes next to the, the, the sequence uh, lanes on the left-hand side of this display. And you can see there's a pause at every single uh, known methylated base. You can determine methylated bases by other methods as well. But, so now then, the computational biology predicted a set of SNO genes. In fact, ultimately all of the uh, SNO genes in the UCM, we think, uh, explaining all of the methyl groups at least. And one by one, these were knocked out uh, cleanly, so that there's no gene there anymore for the small RNA. And then you ask, well, how does this affect the methylation as detected by this extension assay? And if you look on the far right-hand side, we're deleted uh, number 40, and you can see that uh, position number uh, 596, uh, near, the, near the bottom, circled in red, which is present in the wild type and all the other mutants, is absent from that particular mutant number 40. So there's no pause there. One infers there's no methylation. And that was the specific site that that SNO RNA guide sequence was predicted to bind. It's, it's, it's aligned with the, the position in the guide where you expect there to be uh, uh, a methylation occurring. And, this, and you can see in each lane there's a different circled red missing uh, black pause site. Um, and until we get <coughs> to the one in the middle, uh, mutant numbers uh, for SNO RNA number 60, and here's actually two missing bands in the same lane. And how that can occur, there's two different ways that a SNO RNA can, uh, knocking out a single gene, a single SNO RNA, can ha have two effect on two different methyl groups. One is if the, if the um, guide sequence can bind to two different places in the ribosomal RNA, and the other is if there are two guide sequences within the same SNO RNA. So now that we have at least some grounding in, uh, in the kind of structures that can occur, now we're going to ask how we m monitor and measure uh, the amounts of these structures in, uh, in biological systems. And we will also see how these structures impact the methods that we use for the quantitation of, of the structures. So we have... Uh, Choices of uh, molecule that we're going to measure uh, when we're monitoring the, uh, the various molecules in the cell. Why are we focusing on RNA? Well, part of it is because of this nice uh, structural continuity between the simple DNA and the very complicated proteins. But the other is that we want to, if we want to study different points in the regulatory and uh, metabolic networks that we'll be talking about at the end of this course having to do with um, systems biology, if we choose to, we want it, every part of the is subject to some kind of control. Transcriptional control is one of the early stages, and then there are many stages subsequent to that that lead to, to the protein and ultimate phenotypes that result in proliferation of the species. If you want to look at con transcriptional control, it would not do well to study protein um, because the, the closest thing to transcriptional control that you can measure is the uh, RNA products. You can, you can study the transcriptional control itself directly as well by studying the DNA protein interactions. But if you want to measure diffusible uh, molecule RNA is the thing to do. And there are multiple different uh, methods for getting at co-regulated set of genes, co-regulated at the transcriptional level. If we'll illustrate a few here. And why, why do we need multiple methods? Well, we've talked about random and systematic errors. Random errors you can compensate by uh, repeating the experiment. The random errors will average out, ultimately. Systematic errors, they'll happen the same way over and over again. So you want to have something out of the box to allow you to, to check it, or to model it, or to, uh, to allow you to do 
integration as you might want to have in, uh, in complicated systems. So here, just to start us thinking about integration and checking different um, ways of getting transcriptional co-regulation, let's, let's think about uh, if you look through all the uh, proteins that occur, you'll find proteins that occur together frequently as uh, either as fusions or as separate uh, proteins. Or in operons, they'll occur as uh, coding regions that are clustered together in some species or maybe less clustered in other species. When we have metabolic pathways where a uh, small molecule will be shared by, uh, as the, the product of one will be the substrate of another and so on, you'll have this chain of events uh, as in the uh, lower left-hand corner. And these, these sets of enzymes that need to be uh, uh, working together need to be co-expressed. They, they, they need to uh, come up together and go down together when they're not needed. They need to come up when they're suddenly needed. And so you might have an entire pathway or set of pathways that are co-expressed. And one way to do that is to cluster them in the genome. Uh, when they are co-expressed, you will sometimes find upstream of them motifs such as, such as this. Again, here's the two bits uh, for the vertical scale, um, where this, this might be uh, enriched. And so this would be another indicate. So when you find these uh, in front of uh, genes, you might expect them to be co-regulated. When you find a set of proteins that are uh, consistently together in different organisms, so-called phylogenetic profiles, you will find that this um, set of proteins that is involved in a common enzymatic pathway, metabolic pathway, are not only co-regulated and found together but in, in, in along the chromosome, but they're found together when you go through many different species. They will be deleted or inserted as a block or, or they'll be found scattered around the genome, but, but, if, but you'll find that, that when one disappears, they all disappear in general, statistically speaking. This, this phylogenetic co-occurrence is another clue that they, you might expect them to be co-regulated in those genomes in which they, are, they do co-occur. Anyway, and microarrays will be, uh, and variations on that theme will be the main thing that we'll talk about. But I wanted to put it in the context, and I'll just expand on one of these. Um, at the bottom here, this, the, um, in slide 22, it, this is an algorithm for reconstructing likely combinations um, where in some organisms you might have the entire biosynthetic pathway as, as, a, as a series of genes which encode one by one all the proteins in this case that are involved in purine biosynthesis from simpler molecules. But in other organisms, you might have uh, them scattered all over the genome, but they might be co-regulated. Their RNAs might go up and down together. And so, you, so if you look at enough genomes, you can reconstruct the likely combination of, uh, of enzymes. And here's how it might work. In any one of these, for example, E. coli, you might see that they're scattered about. A pair here, a pair there. Singletons don't help much. But if you take all the pairs from a lot of different organisms, um, you, can f you can reconstruct this network where you say, oh, uh, this gene we'll call L, Q, Y, C, all these are probably involved in the same process. If you get a hint for what any one of them does, say one of them is involved in purine biosynthesis, then you find that they all are, and you guess that they might be co-regulated uh, very tightly. So now let's figure out how we actually measure that they're co-regulated very tightly. And the way we can do that, uh, as we do that, whatever method we use, we want to ask, are we interested in ratios, relative changes, or are we interested in absolute values? There are various things that we uh, can do with absolute amounts that are very hard to do with ratios. In particular, if we want to ask, um, is a particular protein level high because its uh, translation is efficient, or is it high because its transcription is efficient? If you find that it's full of, of abundant codons, as if it wants to be efficiently translated, is it also have a high-level promoter as if it wants to be transcriptionally 
uh, active. These sorts of questions um, really benefit from having absolute amounts, meaning uh, you know, so many molecules of RNA per cell, so many molecules of protein per cell. When we get to, to direct causality, we want to get at the motif. Um, this would be one of the objectives of doing the RNA quantitation to allow us to, to cluster RNAs that, that, that are co-expressed and then to, to start looking for motifs and direct causality. Another thing that we might want to do is to classify. We can ask whether um, small molecules or mutations such as occur in cancers cause enough of a signature that you can then use those to say, okay, this um, cell state that we see is a recognizable small molecule effect or stress effect or mutational effect, cancer. Okay. Now, when we, uh, we will be talking about microarray and related uh, methods, but I want you to, to question uh, the advantages and disadvantages of these methods. And so I'll, uh, I'll compare it to a number, of uh, a number but it, let's start with the, the most dramatic comparison, which is uh, with uh, in a C2 hybridization. So in array hybridization, you'll have uh, tens of thousands of different um, gene probes mobilized on a solid surface. And you'll label up uh, the RNA from a, a mixture of different cells, different uh, mixture of different RNAs within a cell. And, but you'll be able to ask questions about 10,000 genes at a time. In an in situ experiment, it's the other way around. You take a cell in its fairly na natural environment, uh, usually fixed, but fixed with maintaining the spatial uh, aspects. Then if you look within the cell with a single gene at a time, or maybe two or three at a time, a very small number, not tens of thousands, you can look to see whether the RNA is is uniformly spread throughout the cell and uniformly spread throughout all the cells in the tissue or in, say, you've got a, a, a mixed population of yeast cells, whatever. And you, all, and you can find cases in the literature where it is not uniformly present in all the cells and not even uniformly within a cell. Here is one of the more dramatic cases where the two X chromosomes in uh, mammals behave differently from one another. Uh, Female mammals will have uh, one RNA, um, one chromosome expressing mo most of its RNAs at normal levels, and the other chromosome expressing almost no RNAs. It is expressing at least one RNA, and that RNA is lo which is uh, XIST, and it's a, a, a covering that whole chromosome, or is localized over that chromosome and not the rest of the cell. So this is an extreme case of localization. Um, that you can monitor with microscopic methods, um, fluorescent microscopic methods. Instead, we'll uh, keep this in the back of your mind as you look through uh, the uh, sort of microarray and other experiments where you're mushing together a, a variety of cells that might be in different stages of the cell cycle, might have slightly different environments, and even within the cell, the RNA, you're losing the information about the RNA localization. Um, let's uh, take a short break and then come back and uh, connect uh, on, finish up on the in situ hybridization and uh, connect to other methods for quantitation of RNA. Uh, 